And the scripture says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. And the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, O blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Well, good morning. Welcome to worship. It's good to be here together and it's good to be joined by those who are uh, in their living rooms at home on, on Zoom. Today is the Festival of Christ the King, a Sunday when we remember that Christ is King of all of our lives and of this world. It's kind of a church New Year's Eve. This is the last Sunday of the old year. And you might recall as we began Advent back a year ago, things were heating up with bushfires and uh, it wasn't long before our country was on fire. It wasn't long after that before we heard of a pandemic coming our way. So probably not a bad idea to head next week into a new year. Uh, some of the themes we'll be thinking of. Our gospel reading is the interesting story of the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25 where Jesus, it seems, separates those destined for glory and, and from the others. So lots of interesting themes and uh, as I said it's good to be here together to open them up as God's people in this place. Let's offer our worship to our God with a word of prayer and let us pray. Holy God, we know your Son, Jesus, as Christ the King, the one beyond all kings, beyond us in love, beyond us in compassion. Christ the King, glorious in mercy, glorious in grace, glorious in kindness. We come now to worship you, Holy God, and we pray for your reign in all the earth. We pray that your kingdom may indeed come. And so, Holy Christ, send your spirit among us and into every place where people long for you. Make yourself known in our midst that we may see another way of being royal people, the people of your way, your soul, and your life. We thank you, Holy God, that you came to us in Jesus, the one who is one of us and like us, and yet the one whose name is beyond all names. We thank you that you do not settle for less than the great hope of love for all mankind. We thank you that people like us can be other than we are, and that the world that we know is not the last word. We thank you that when we look around us and are discouraged, you raise up among us people who call us on to another way, a better way, your way. We seek your presence in our worship. In Jesus' name, amen. And so indeed, our worship began well with uh, Gerald's selection of an introit. We agree with Johann Sebastian Bach that uh, the Lord is our hope. And so we begin with a hymn of praise, the hymn number 216, Rejoice the Lord is King. As I'm sure you're all aware, if you're here in the, in the church, we're invite, asking you not to sing. If you're joining us on Zoom, you're most welcome to join with uh, Brian and sing this beautiful Wesley hymn, Rejoice, the Lord is King.
And now a prayer of confession. A confession for Christ the King. Let us pray. Holy and merciful God, we approach you now in awe and trembling. For your Son Jesus is Christ the King. We stand before you as though we are the sheep and the goats waiting in the moment when you look at us and you see us as we are. We ask ourselves what you will see when you look at our lives and you look at our priorities and our purposes as we walk the path of life this day. O oh God, a royal one whose love fills the universe, if we have been concerned for ourselves alone, forgive us. And if we have believed that you will be satisfied with songs of praise and prayers of adoration, gracious God, forgive our superficial faith. And if we've lost heart in the struggle to transform this world into a place which is worthy of your costly love for all people, forgive us and renew us in strength. If we've forgotten the great hope to which we are called and we've settled for far less, holy God, forgive us. May the Christ forgive us. As we bring our confessions and wonder whether we are indeed the sheep or the goats, we hear again the word to us in Christ. We are called to a rich and glorious inheritance among the saints. We are called to a greater hope than we will ever understand. Jesus takes our hand, forgives us, and offers us the power in the Holy Spirit to live out that hope from this day forward and leaving the past behind. As we bring our confessions and as we remind ourselves of God's love for us, we make the claim that our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And so now may the peace of the Lord be always with you. But I invite you by gesture and uh, with eye contact to uh, pass the peace to someone uh, that you can see, someone with insight range. If you're there in the watching on Zoom, peace be with you. The first reading this morning comes from Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever. And the Gospel reading is from Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, 
When was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are, the mem are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison or did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. For the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. What a terrifying reading as we prepare to reflect upon it. Let's pause for a word of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your word, which is a light for our path and a lamp for our feet. We pray your blessing now as we seek to interpret this scripture. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Christ the King. What does it mean to say that Christ is King? I would suggest to you that to different people and in different times that has meant all kinds of different things. Indeed, almost contradictory things. But it seems to me as we move slowly and carefully out of a pandemic, as we move into a new church year next Sunday and to a new calendar year on the 1st of January 2021, I think it makes a lot of sense to reflect together on that theme. How do we make Christ the king of our lives and of our societies? I think you would agree that once the history books write the story of Donald Trump's presidency. The enduring image will be that image in the midst of the Black Lives Matters protests. The image of a demagogue holding up a Bible with a very strange grip on the thing. That picture, with all its disturbing resonances, will tell the story of a four-year presidency and I think it tells the story of one approach to the idea of what it means for Christ to be king. I'm sure you'll remember the day. America was uh, in the midst of dreadful and frightening violent protests following uh, a dreadful death at the hands of the, of the police. Washington was as much in tumult as anywhere else. And for some reason or another, Donald Trump organized for the military to clear a path. He went across to the front of a church, a church that uh, incidentally didn't want him there. And in a time of great tumult, he literally weaponized the Christian Bible. He weaponized the Christian faith. He claimed, I would have thought, by doing what he did, that the Bible belonged to him not to those who were seeking justice for black Americans. He was claiming 
that the Bible belonged to his way of doing things. And if he was asked what it meant for Christ to be king, his answer, I would suspect, would be quite different to uh, yours and to mine. Later, when interviewed, the journalist pressed him and he, he could not identify whose Bible it was that he, he'd held up. Whose Bible is that was, of course, one of the great questions that a, a journalist has ever asked a politician. When pressed, he couldn't identify a favourite passage in the Bible. When pressed, he couldn't uh, say whether he preferred the Old or the New Testament. He, he liked it all, he said. But I'm pretty sure he wouldn't have liked this passage from Matthew 25. I'm pretty sure that the kingship that he imagined Jesus to be about is a kingship quite different to that suggested by Matthew 25's separating the sheep from the goats. Way back in 1985 or 1986, I went to the Sydney Town Hall to hear Desmond Tutu speaking about the struggle for black equality in South Africa. He held up a Bible too. He held it in a way that uh, implied he knew what was inside it and he held it as, as one who, who, uh, who read it and understood it. And that day he made a most extraordinary claim that, uh, that, that I've uh, reflected on ever since. He said that the biggest mistake that the white people made in, in uh, Africa was to give the black people the Bible. Because through reading it, they learnt that God did not ordain that the whites should be in charge and the blacks should duly serve. Through reading scripture, they learnt that God had a special care for the poor and the dispossessed. They learnt his demand that justice should flow like a river. A little sad that in our society, neither South Africa or America, different in so many ways from both those places, in our society, reading the Bible has become a little bit of a pious hangover of a bygone age. The image that people have of Bible reading is a very polite middle-class couple sitting with their children and reading a passage for the day that uh, lifts their hearts but doesn't much change the way that they live. But of course, as Donald Trump didn't uh, really understand, and as that little image tames, the scripture is actually full of challenge, confronts us, confronts the beliefs that we just hold sacred through, uh, through our society and through our conditioning. Today's reading from Matthew that Lynn read for us, if we took it seriously, would have us waking in the middle of the night in a cold sweat. It would have us examining our lives and probably, in the case of most of us, not much liking what we have found. When we have experienced the poor and the dispossessed, how have we reacted? If we reacted coldly or without compassion, how do we feel about the fact that we may have had Jesus before us? As we've uh, discovered over the last few weeks, this little section of Matthew's Gospel is full of big dramatic stories and parables. There's a lot of gnashing of teeth. There's a lot of people being cast into the outer darkness. Essentially what Jesus is saying is that when the judgment comes, God will be separating the sheep and the goats. On the one hand, there will be those who can say that when they saw Jesus hungry, they fed him. When they saw him in prison or sick, they visited him. And for the others, there is the most terrible judgment. There's a couple of issues in that story. The first, of course, is that there's no point caring for the least of these for our own benefit. What's extraordinary is that the people on the right, the ones who had not done the right thing, the, who had done the right thing, had no idea what, what they were doing when they had done it. When did we see you hungry and feed you? When did we see you sick and uh, visit you? Strangely and counterintuitively, 
Jesus himself does not regularly talk about judgments. Matthew's gospel makes a little bit of it in this section, but in general terms, Jesus gets about serving the poor and healing and sharing in life with his disciples and his friends. But when he does talk about judgment, he is in the stream of the Old Testament prophets who make it clear that judgment comes for those who oppress the poor, those who steal from the widows, and those who uh, have no regard for those at the bottom of the heap. Christian discipleship is about, by making Christ king, making it clear that uh, the very least are the ones that count. I think we make a mistake when we listen to this parable to get hung up on the, on the scary side of it, the, the judgment side. We Christians have a terrible reputation when it comes to talking to, about, to people about judgment, don't we? Personally, I, I grew up in a church where judgment was one of the really big themes. The takeaway story of so much of what passed for Christianity in the church that I grew up in was that life was all about getting to heaven. It involved believing the right thing. It involved uh, not committing the kinds of personal sins that uh, we adolescent boys found so attractive. We, we got ourselves tied up in knots of fear of, of a God who actually was a pretty small, vengeful little God. And the stories that we heard in our church about judgment, things ended badly for people who didn't heed the message of the gospel. Not unlike uh, how things end badly for uh, some of the people in, in this Matthew 25 story. But in the church in which I grew up in, the, those who ended up with uh, bad outcomes tended to be the theological liberals, uh, the uh, secular humanists and the other undesirables. We looked at people who had in the past been part of Bible-believing churches but had left and we wondered about their eternal destiny. We called them backsliders. We had a weird Calvinist twisted thinking that explained that those people actually in the first place hadn't been properly saved. Eventually, I didn't buy that kind of thinking. Eventually, that judgment mentality came to me not to represent Christianity, but a judgment, judgmental moralistic puritanism that didn't speak of the God that, that I was starting to understand by reading the Bible myself. When Jesus talks about judgment, he talks about the importance of the least of these, those at the bottom of the heap, the poor and the widow and the downtrodden. We're going to talk about judgment. That's about all that we can be talking about, I would think. Christ the King is the Sunday when we make the affirmation that our own desires and needs and hopes and dreams are not the King. Making the best for ourselves is what we're called to do by our materialistic culture. But the faith that we live makes a different claim. It claims that uh, Christ is King. And if Christ is king, then our lives look different and our society looks differently too. By saying that uh, Christ is king, we reflect on the world in which we live and we say that uh, indeed it is Christ and not the, uh, the populist leaders that seem to have taken over in so many parts of the world who are king. We say that the least of these matter. We say that uh, the world in which we live needs to turn and live differently. Otherwise, we're in so much trouble. Christ the King. If we uh, can make that claim, we can say, as Charles Wesley did, a, a, a rejoicing as we do it. Rejoice, our Lord is King.
Let's pause for prayer. Gracious God, we, as we pause and reflect on the church year that is gone, we think of all the upset and tumult and difficulty. We think of the months without joining physically to gather. We think of the broken lives that happened earlier in the year through bushfire and floods and storms. And in all the upset and tumults of life, we ask that you might help us to understand what it means to claim that you are the king as we move into a new liturgical year. We do that anxious to move towards Christmas and just the celebration of the baby born in the manger. We do making that baby the Lord of Lords and the Prince of Peace. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And our hymn is the hymn number 618. It takes up the ethical demand that follows from making Christ the King. 618, what does the Lord require? Good morning, everybody. Today, the studies begin this afternoon at four o'clock here in the church with Clive Pearson. And um, Peter certainly encourages you to come or on Zoom. If you're going to participate on Zoom, could you let Michael know because he will need to send you the link for the computer to get into it. So please try and come. They're well worth it. And you don't have to have any prior knowledge or be a brilliant theologian or anything. It's really good. Gaiklin um, is taking some leave and she will be back on the 22nd of December. So uh, Michael is going to divert the office phone to his phone. So if you call, you'll get him. Um, but the, the call will be answered at least. The Christmas hampers are coming along nicely and uh, the 6th of December is the last Sunday to bring things. 
So if you haven't already done so, please go shopping. Uh, and the list is in the newsletter each week. Um, Prue is going to take on the Christmas Bowl um, organising this year. So that will commence next week with, that, with the beginning of Advent. And then um, Barbara asked me if I could just mention that um, some of Alison's, well, Alison's family were up here at the weekend, or a couple of days ago, uh, and they would like to give, if anybody needs a lightweight walker, it's a wonderful little walker that has a tray, so you can put your cup of tea on it or your plate of whatever on it and wheel it away um, along with yourself. And uh, she has that, that's sitting there and is um, available if anybody would like it or find it useful for someone they know. Um, so just let Barbara know. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. I would just like to uh, offer an encouragement to come along this afternoon. Clive Pearson is an extremely highly credentialed theologian. He was formerly the principal of our theological college. He has a special interest in uh, the Pacific and the theology that can make sense in the Pacific Islands and in New Zealand and in Australia. He has a special interest in climate change. But his, his gift in these studies, I've been to the last few, has been to open up one of the Gospels in a way that uh, everybody can understand. As Lynn said, don't feel like you need special expertise. But if you've always read John's Gospel and wondered why it's different to the rest, spending four weeks with, with Clive, beginning at four o'clock this week, will uh, open up a whole world to you. So please come if you can. As Lynn said, if you want to join up by Zoom, just indicate to me and I'll send you an email with the link. I'll also give you, if you're joining by Zoom, the papers that go with the, this week's study. So please join us. Now back in the olden days, before pandemics, at a time like this, in the worship there'd be an offering. Music would play and uh, someone would bring a plate around seeking your, your gifts to bless the life of the church. Those days have gone. We are encouraging people to give electronically if they can, but we are also making available the opportunity. If you, if you have a cash gift you want to bring up the back corner, there is, there is a plate. And this time now, it's, it's not so much for, uh, for doing that physical giving, but to reflect on, on, on how we offer ourselves to Christ the King. So now there's a little musical interlude, a reflection of, and an offering, and then uh, Bev will bring the intercessions. Thanks, Gerald.
As we come to our prayers today, I will tell you that each verse of our prayer ends with the words, In your mercy, and I invite you to respond to those words with, Hear our prayer as usual. Let us pray. Jesus Christ, true ruler of the created world, we pray for the people of the world, especially today for victims of war, brutality and oppression. We recognize with dismay and shame the role members of our SAS force have played in the murder of innocent Afghan people as we wait for full revelation of their crime, for justice and for recompense to be made. <coughs> we give thanks for leaders who serve the common good and for all who call out injustice as they wait for peace and a better world. Make us a people whose hearts are ruled by your mercy and your compassion. And in your mercy, hear our prayer. Jesus Christ, true shepherd to all your sheep, we pray for your church, for courage in places of persecution, for renewed zeal in places of apathy, for unity in places of discord and division. We give you thanks and pray for all who are shepherds to your people, priests, pastors, and all who minister in your name. Make us a people whose hearts are ruled by your forgiveness and grace, and in your mercy, hear our prayer. Jesus Christ, true companion to all who seek you. We pray for those to whom our lives are bound, for our families, our friends, and all whom we love, for our congregation, and for those with whom we work and play. We give you thanks for all whose care and daily work saves lives, remembering particularly all who strive to bring COVID-19 under control, and all who have developed a successful vaccine. Make us a people whose hearts are ruled by your reconciliation and love, and in your mercy, hear our prayer. Jesus Christ, true comforter to all who suffer, we pray for all in special need. We think particularly today of Margaret's uncle Len, who passed last week, and think of all the family in their loss and grief. In silence, we name before you those for whom we care, who are in need of your healing presence. We give you thanks for all who bring healing and hope to those in need. Make us a people whose hearts are ruled by your compassion and hope, and in your mercy, hear our prayer. Jesus Christ, true ruler of earth and heaven, we give you thanks and praise for your faithful servants of every age. <coughs> Help us follow in the footsteps of your saints that we, like them, may be gathered into your eternal presence a people after your own heart, the sheep of your own fold. Jesus Christ, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. And will you join with me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thanks, Beth. Just while we're thinking about prayers for the week ahead. I'd appreciate uh, some prayers this week. I, as uh, my voluntary job, 
uh, assist the Senate I run a committee to do with the, the discipline of ministers. I'll be out of Sydney for a couple of days this week on one of those matters. I don't know why the church thought I'd be good working with ministers who were silly and did stupid things, but uh, they've, picked, they've picked me for that role. And so a couple of days this week, I'll be dealing with a, a matter along those lines. And these things are never all that much fun. So as I said, I'd appreciate prayers. Our final hymn for today is the hymn number 158, God Has Spoken by His Prophets. In a moment I'll be offering a blessing. After that we will uh, be hearing an unusually magnificent postlude from Cheryl. I was at a rehearsal yesterday so I know about that. But we're also inviting you once we've had the blessing and the postlude to, if you can, stay in your seats for a little bit of a conversation. Morning tea is a very important part of uh, a church's life, is it not? and uh, the pandemic has made that difficult but the way that we've uh, managed to keep ourselves connected is, is just by uh, talking to the microphone, sharing with those who are on Zoom just a little of what might be going on in each of our lives and so if you can, please stay and, and say something to, uh, to the group if you can't, of course, you're welcome to leave once we've uh, concluded with the postlude and so we go from this place as the people of God. Ours is a royal calling. And the world waits for our merging in every place and in every time. And may Christ the King be our power. May God the loving Father protect us. And may the Spirit be a light to our path. Let's go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. Amen.